Hello, uh, good afternoon. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, my name is John Chan. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon at CVS Kale Hospital. Uh, and welcome to this uh, webinar, which we're doing with MMA in Agri um, I'm told I can't hear you, but uh, if you have any messages or any questions, you could type this in and I will answer this as I, as I go along. Or if you can't uh, hear me properly, you want me to speak louder, then uh, please do, do let me know as well. So um, let me try and share my screen. Okay, I, I hope you can see this, the screen. So I've been asked to talk on when is surgery the best option in heart, lung and chest diseases. So I, I thought I would cover uh, the common conditions uh, of the heart, lung and chest, which we commonly treat by, by surgery. So of course, the one of the most common conditions we treat is heart valve diseases. And uh, this just to remind, remind you of the uh, heart valve of the patient. Essentially, the three heart valves here uh, cause the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve. And there's also a fourth valve called the pulmonary valve. The pulmonary valve, fortunately, does not tend to cause too much problems in adult life, although it does uh, cause problems in child, childhood. But in the adult patients, the most common valves which cause problems are the aortic valve, the uh, mitral valve, and the tricuspid valve. And this is a section through the heart, as if we've cut the heart in half, and uh, looking at the heart from the top downwards. And you can see that the three valves are really very close to, to each other. And also it is very closely related to the coronary arteries. And so uh, at surgery for the heart valves, we have to be uh, mindful of the other structures which are in proximity to the, to the uh, valve. So if we start with the mitral valve, the mitral valve essentially has got two leaflets. There's an anterior leaflet here and the posterior leaflet. And uh, the free edge of the mitral valve is supported by this caudate tendine, uh, which then attached to the papillary muscles of the, the left ventricle. So a few things can go wrong with the mitral valve. Uh, it can leak, obviously. Mitral regurgitation can occur. and uh, so this is just a case of a 75-year-old lady. She had been complaining of increasing shortness of breath for one month. And echocardiography had shown severe mitral regurgitation due to posterior leaflet prolapse. The left ventricular function was preserved. Uh, the coronary angiogram showed stenosis in the right coronary artery. So this is the echocardiogram. And you can see the, this is the mitral valve. The mitral valve has two leaflets. This is the anterior leaflet and that's the posterior leaflet. And you can see this tissue here, which should not be there. This is part of the posterior leaflet, which has ruptured. So there's a flail leaflet. And the result is uh, this jet of mitral regurgitation. So this is a, a, a severe mitral regurgitation due to posterior leaflet prolapse. And this is essentially what has happened. The caudate tendine supporting the pos posterior papillary muscle has ruptured and uh, caused the mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation can also be caused by excess leaflet tissue. Uh, some some uh, patients over time, the mitral valve just enlarges and then due to the excess leaflet tissue, the valve fails to close properly. So uh, this is also a, a cause, a common cause of mitral regurgitation. 
So there are several treatment options for this patient. If the mitral regurgitation is not too severe, if it's only moderate in severity, then you can control the, the symptoms with uh, medications, namely with diuretics, some ACE inhibitors and spironolactone, some beta blockers or ARB blockers. Uh, but if the regurgitation is severe, then surgery would be indicated because it is a mechanical problem. Uh, so, so the best treatment is to uh, fix the mitral valve uh, through surgery if the mitral regurgitation is severe. Now, if we look at what happens to severe mitral regurgitation, if we just manage it medically without uh, surgery, uh, this is from the time of diagnosis, and this is over 10 years. So over 10 years, about 30% of these patients would have gone into atrial fibrillation. This is one of the, this is part of the natural history of severe mitral regurgitation. 60% would have gone into congestive heart failure. They would have needed at least one hospital admission for congestive heart failure. 80% would have uh, gone for surgery and 90% of the patients would either have had surgery or have passed away. So in other words, this is a condition which will require surgery uh, in the next 10 years uh, if you have severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, and now we know that the earlier the surgery is done, the better the outcomes are for the patient. So this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic uh, by Jelinov et al. Uh, showing what happens to, to patients after they've had surgery depending on the stage at which they have surgery. So if the patients have surgery when they have no symptoms, when they were diagnosed with severe mitral regurgitation, uh, they live a lot longer compared to patients who have surgery uh, who, when they have mild symptoms. And then if the patients wait until they have severe symptoms, that is NYHA class three or four, before they have surgery, then the survival at 20 years uh, is a lot less compared to those who have surgery when they have NYHA 1 or 2. So the earlier the patient has surgery, once they are diagnosed with severe mitral regurgitation, uh, the better the, the survival for these patients. And this was a study looking at more than 4,200 uh, patients. And this is a study by Enrico Sarano from the Mayo Clinic in which she compared patients who had mitral valve repair and those who have had mitral valve replacement. And you can see that the solid lines are those who have had mitral valve repair. Uh, these patients uh, live longer compared to those who have the mitral valve replaced. So whenever possible, it is always better to repair the mitral valve rather than to replace it because it is all the uh, patient's own tissue and also because we do not have an ideal uh, artificial valve uh, at, at present. Now, following mitral valve repair surgery, in fact, as you can see, the life expectancy of the patient returns back to normal. So the, uh, the, the, you can expect the patients who have a mitral valve repair uh, to live as long as the uh, expected survivor in the normal population. There are several techniques to uh, repair the mitral valve, and uh, this is one of them. So in the example which I've just shown, this would be the, the technique of choice because the problem in that patient was the, the caudate tendon had ruptured. So the way to repair this uh, leaking mitral valve is just to replace the ruptured caudate with a new artificial caudate. Uh, and this is uh, what, what is shown here. Uh, in the other types of mitral regurgitation where there's a lot of excess leaflet tissue, then we can uh, reset the excess leaflet tissue so that the mitral valve becomes the normal shape and size again uh, to restore the, the competency of, of the mitral valve. So this that patient had the mitral valve repair and also had a single coronary bypass graft, the right coronary artery. Uh, she had an uneventful recovery and two years after the surgery, now she is uh, asymptomatic. Uh, and this is the result uh, after the repair. You can see the leaflet is no longer flail. 
and there is uh, no mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is another example to illustrate a different sort of mitral regurgitation. So this is a 66-year-old man, and uh, he had been complaining of angina and shortness of breath on exertion over the past month. And a coronary angiogram sh showed that he had severe three-vessel coronary artery disease. The echocardiography showed moderate uh, LV systolic function. And as you can see here, the infralateral wall is not thickening so well. There's an area of marked infarction here. Uh, the ejection fraction was uh, about 40%, so moderate impairment of the left ventricular function. And there was moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. You could probably notice from this uh, echo image that the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve is a little bit restricted. It's not uh, moving as freely as the anterior leaflet. Uh, and that's because the uh, papillary muscles, the caudal tendineal from this leaflet attached to the papillary muscles in this region of the left ventricle where there's been a myocardial infarction. So the, the problem in these patients are that the impaired left ventricular contractility or the dilated left ventricle restricts or tatters the uh, mitral valve leaflet and so prevents it from closing uh, properly and causing the, the mitral regurgitation. And you can see that this patient ha has got a moderately uh, severe uh, mitral regurgitation due to restriction of the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So this is a condition called ischemic mitral regurgitation where following a myocardial infarction the, the non-contracting part of the left ventricle remodels and dilates and pulls the uh, mitral valve leaflets apart. So it fails to call up adequately at this region and mitral regurgitation uh, results. So a technique to correct this type of mitral regurgitation is just to uh, suture a new uh, ring, what we call an annuloplasty ring. It's essentially like a new door frame. Uh, to restore back the mitral annulus to the, to the same uh, size as it was before. Uh, typically also to improve the co-optation between the leaflets, we often undersize the, the annuloplasty ring by uh, one or two sizes. And this is the uh, result after surgery. You can see there's no more mitral regurgitation and you can see that there's the mitral annuloplasty ring here. And he, at the same time, had three bypass grafts because we also have to treat the uh, myocardial ischemia in this the coronary, coronary disease in these patients. Uh, he had an uneventful post-operative recovery and is asymptomatic at six months. So this is a study uh, which look at whether we should repair the moderate degrees of ischemic mitral regurgitation at the time of coronary bypass graft surgery. Uh, and it showed that if we did the valve repair at the same time as bypass grafting, the patients had a better functional capacity as measured by peak oxygen consumption, which improved by about 20% in those who had the bypass graft plus mitral valve repair compared to those who just had the bypass surgery. And along with that, the left ventricle got smaller uh, more significantly in those who had the valve repair in addition to bypass surgery as compared to those who just had the, the bypass surgery. Another type of mitral valve problem is of course the rheumatic mitral valve disease. Uh, and in this condition, the mitral valve leaflets are typically very thickened and uh, fibrose. Uh, so mitral regurgitation uh, due to mitral stenosis, it's more challenging to uh, repair because the leaflet tissue is often very, uh, very uh, fibrous and diseased. But it is still, and this is what it looks like at surgery. You can see the leaflets are not normal looking, but it can still be repaired uh, using some autologous pericardium. That is pericardium from the, the patient. The patient's own pericardium can be used to uh, reconstruct the mitral valve leaflets. Uh, and this may be preferable in the younger female patients of childbearing age uh, due to the uh, challenges of managing, managing a mechanical uh, mitral valve uh, at childbirth. 
So uh, rheumatic mitral valve disease uh, is typically more challenging to repair and very often we have to replace the mitral valve for rheumatic disease. But for degenerative mitral regurgitation, uh, most of those cases uh, can be successfully repaired. Uh, if we have to replace the, the mitral valve, there are two types of valve we have. One is a mechanical valve and the other one is a tissue valve. So the mechanical valve is made from titanium and, and carbon. Uh, it has a long durability, typically will last uh, the patient's lifetime. Uh, that's not to say that it's not without its problems. It does have uh, the risk of endocarditis and thromboembolic complications. So it needs uh, the warfarin and the warfarin control has to be adequate. So they need uh, frequent INR checking uh, to ensure that the warfarin has anticoagulated to the uh, correct level and not too, too much. The other option uh, is a bovine or porcine a heart valve. Uh, this has the advantage that you do not require warfarin, uh, but it has a limited durability. In the mitral position, it would last between 10 to 15 years. So typically in the younger patients, we would recommend a mechanical uh, mitral valve and in the older patients, those aged 70 and above, we would recommend a tissue, tissue valve. Uh, of course, uh, and this is why it's bet better to repair the mitral valve if possible, because it is the patient's own tissue. Uh, the durability is just as long as that of a mechanical valve. And the advantage is that it, there's no need to, to take warfarin. So whenever possible, uh, it's always better to repair the mitral valve uh, but of course, in rheumatic uh, heart valve disease, it may not always be possible to repair the mitral valve and it may be uh, necessary to replace the, the mitral valve. So the take home message for mitral regurgitation is that patients with severe mitral regurgitation will need surgery. The earlier the surgery is performed, the better the outcome for the patient and uh, mitral valve repair is better than uh, replacement uh, when possible. Uh, this is a book I, I wrote some time ago, so if you're interested, you could uh, uh, get more information from there. Uh, I'm just trying to see if uh, I can see the questions, if you have any. Okay, so no questions so far. If you have any questions, you could type them in the, I think, the chat box and then I could uh, answer any questions as, as, I, as we go along. So if there are no questions on mitral regurgitation, uh, you could still type questions if there are any as we, as we go on. Uh, but if there are no questions, then we go on to aortic stenosis. We go on to the aortic valve and a common uh, problem with uh, the aortic valve is aortic stenosis. Um, so aortic stenosis, uh, typically, uh, you, you can be quite, we, we can manage aortic stenosis with, with medication uh, quite well for a period of time, provided uh, the patient has no symptoms, provided they are asymptomatic. But the moment the symptoms uh, develop for the patient, there are symptoms of angina or syncope or heart failure, then uh, we really need to uh, replace the aortic valve because if we don't, you can see here that the survivor just drops uh, very quickly uh, the moment the uh, patients develop symptoms. Uh, but nowadays, because of our better understanding of aortic stenosis, we will actually recommend surgery even if the patient was asymptomatic uh, because um, uh, aortic stenosis is really a condition where it is almost impossible to resuscitate the patient if, if the patient uh, Pass, uh, becomes unstable due to aortic stenosis. And very often it is difficult to be sure that the patient is, gen is truly asymptomatic. Uh, but if, if, the, uh, uh, if you really want to, you could do an exercise test to, to ensure that patients with severe aortic stenosis are truly asymptomatic. And if on an exercise stress test, the patient is really asymptomatic, then you can continue to manage them medically. Uh, but if there's any indication that they are symptomatic, then uh, an aortic valve replacement uh, is recommended for, for these patients. 
So this is an example of the uh, aortic stenosis. You can see in this case, uh, this is a bicuspid valve. Uh, usually the aortic valve is tricuspid, there are three leaflets. But in some patients, they can have a bicuspid valve. And if you have bicuspid aortic valve disease, you are at risk of aortic stenosis due to the turbulence in the flow through this valve. Uh, it does tend to put these patients at risk of aortic uh, stenosis. And also the aortic wall is thinner in these patients. So they are also at risk of uh, aortic disease. So you can see how uh, thickened uh, and calcified this valve is. So at surgery, we would have to uh, excise all of this thickened valve and we will also have to uh, decalcify, remove the calcium from the aortic annulus to implant a new valve in. So this is the uh, diagram where the aortic valve is excised and a new valve is sutured uh, into the aortic annulus to, to replace the diseased aortic valve. Uh, as you can see here, the difference in survival in those with severe aortic stenosis who are just treated with uh, medication uh, compared to those who uh, uh, manage with surgery. So uh, unlike mitral valve disease where uh, you can, if you want to live quite a long time uh, without uh, surgery, but of course you will get more short of breath, more symptomatic, and in the long term, the survival is not as good. Uh, but in aortic stenosis, uh, if you have symptoms and you do not go for surgery, then the survivor uh, drops uh, very fast and very quickly. So this uh, is one condition, uh, aortic stenosis, where you really should not wait too long before surgery once you are diagnosed with uh, severe aortic stenosis. Uh, again, as in the uh, mitral valve, there are two types of valve which we can use two common types of valve. One is a tissue valve made from porcine or bovine tissue, and the other is a mechanical, uh, mechanical heart valve. And uh, the age, the durability of the valve depends on the age at which it is implanted. So if we implant a tissue valve in someone uh, above 70 years of age, you can see at 15 years, 90% of the valves are still very good. But if we implant them in a younger patient, uh, in a patient in the 50s, you can see that at 15 years, only half of the valves are still good. The other half had degenerated. Uh, and, that is what, and that is the reason why we recommend in younger patients uh, to use a mechanical valve. Uh, but in older patients, to avoid the need for anticoagulation, uh, we would recommend a tissue valve. Uh, the reason the valve lasts sh uh, for a shorter duration in the younger patients uh, is because the younger patients are more active. So there's, uh, the there's, a, more, there's a greater hem hemodynamic strain on the uh, tissue heart valve in, in younger active patients compared to uh, older patients. And this again is the differences between tissue and mechanical valve. Uh, it boils down to the patient preference, of course. If we have a young patient who is very active, uh, who does a lot of contact sports and does not want to take warfarin, then, they, then they, they still can have a tissue valve, but they have to accept that some time, some, at some stage in their lifetime, they will need another uh, operation for their uh, aortic valve. Of course, now we have the uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement option. Uh, and this is a new treatment where we do not need to do open surgery. Uh, to replace the uh, aortic valve. We can, uh, through a small uh, puncture in the femoral artery in the groin, we can push up uh, the, the valve, which is uh, compressed together, and then position it under X-ray guidance uh, to where the aortic valve is, and then deploy the valve uh, uh, at the uh, site of the aortic valve. So this is uh, treatment called transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Essentially, it pushes apart the uh, disease aortic valve. So it is a new valve which is put inside the old valve uh, to replace the, uh, the old valve. So uh, some, uh, some, some people will call it transcatheter aortic valve implantation because they're implanting a new valve rather than transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So it is either called uh, TAVR, T-A-V-R, 
transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVI, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Uh, now this technology is still very new and so unfortunately it's very expensive uh, in this country. And also we do not know the, the long-term uh, results from, from, this, uh, from this valve. But uh, what we do know uh, is that, uh, so this is a meta-analysis of all the uh, studies done, all the randomized trials which have been done comparing uh, TAVI uh, versus uh, the surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, and so what we know from all these randomized trials when we put together all the trials is that in the first one year, uh, the TAVI valve is much better than surgical valve. Uh, and if you look at this, the y-axis is the incidence of all-cause mortality. And this is the months since uh, valve implantation in the x-axis. And, and this red dotted line is surgical aortic valve replacement. And the blue dotted lines is the TAVI, the transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And you, so you can see in the first year, uh, the survivor is much, uh, the better with the TAVI valve because the mortality is much higher uh, after surgical aortic valve replacement compared to the uh, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Between uh, one year to uh, up to four, uh, three, four years, uh, there's no difference uh, in survival between the surgical aortic valve replacement and the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Uh, but beyond uh, four years, uh, as you can see here, the mortality with the transcatheter aortic valve implantation, this blue line here, uh, is then higher compared to uh, the surgical aortic valve uh, implantation. So what we are doing now is that we recommend the, the TAVI valve, the TAVI valve for the patients who are not fit for surgery. Uh, because clearly if they are too sick for surgery, then uh, TAVA is still better than just medical treatment. Uh, in fact, the survival in the first year is better than compared to, uh, to surgical uh, aortic valve replacement. Uh, but if, you're, if the patient is fit enough for surgery, the risk is of going through uh, conventional aortic valve replacement is not high, then we would still recommend the surgical aortic valve replacement rather than the uh, TAVA because the long-term survival is still better uh, with the surgical aortic valve replacement compared to the, the, the TAVA. But of course now in very sick patients, we have the option to at least treat them uh, better than just taking medication with the uh, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And that will improve the symptoms and also improve their, their survival compared to uh, just taking medication. So the take home message, patients with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis should undergo urgent uh, aortic valve replacement. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement is now an option in those who are unfit to go through conventional aortic valve replacement. Uh, the aortic valve can also leak. Aortic regurgitation can occur. Uh, in aortic regurgitation, the, the uh, urgency of the surgery is not uh, there as compared to aortic stenosis. But if the, so, so you can actually manage patients with aortic regurgitation uh, for quite a period of time with medication. Uh, but you do have to watch if the patient becomes symptomatic, uh, uh, with shortness of breath, or if the heart uh, size starts enlarging with an end diastolic diameter above 75 millimeter or end systolic diameter above 55 millimeters, or the LV function starts getting impaired then that would be the time to uh, recommend surgery for, for these patients. Uh, these patients often with severe aortic regurgitation, they will remain asymptomatic for quite some time uh, because the, as the heart enlarges, it compensates for the aortic regurgitation. So with each uh, beat of the heart, it ejects more blood out of the heart. Uh, but of course, once the heart reaches a certain size, uh, then it can no longer compensate. And that's the time when the patient will notice uh, that they have got uh, something wrong with the with, with their heart. They will notice the symptoms of uh, shortness of breath. Uh, we have to be careful that you do not let the heart become too big because then the risk of surgery would be much higher. So I think these guidelines are quite good from the uh, 
uh, from the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, it gives the uh, threshold size for which surgery would be recommended for uh, severe aortic stenosis uh, regurgitation. So in severe aortic regurgitation, aortic valve replacement is indicated when the patient is symptomatic or if there is LV dilatation or LV impairment. Any questions so far on the aortic valve or mitral valve? No, if not, okay, we'll continue on. Uh, so we go on now to the aorta. Uh, we can uh, talk about aortic dissection. So uh, this is an example, a 42-year-old lady complained of sudden onset of chest, abdominal and back pain, and it was the worst pain uh, in her life. Uh, a CT scan had shown a Stanford type A aortic dissection extending from the aortic root to the iliac arteries. And uh, this was confirmed on echocardiography, which also showed moderate aortic regurgitation. So the diagnosis of an aortic dissection uh, is by CT scan. And you can see that this is a, a tear in the ascending aorta and also uh, involving the descending aorta. It will be, the, the, these patients typically complain of a very severe pain, the most uh, severe uh, pain they've ever had. And uh, I think we have to be uh, aware of a differential diagnosis of aortic dissection uh, in someone with severe chest pain. Uh, of course, it's not as common as coronary disease, uh, but uh, aortic dissection uh, is uh, fairly common, particularly if the patient is hypertensive or if they have a family history of uh, aortic disease or other risk factors for uh, aortic uh, diseases, such, such as if they've got Marfan syndrome or Louis Diaz syndrome. Uh, and the other risk factors are patients who are pregnant with hypertension, uh, they are another uh, group of patients who are at risk of uh, aortic dissections. So what happens in an aortic dissection is that there is a tear in the uh, lining of the aorta, uh, so that blood tracks in between the layers of the aorta right, into what we call a false lumen. And the separation of these layers is what causes the very severe uh, chest pain. Uh, the risk of aortic dissection is that it may rupture uh, because the remaining layer may well rupture. Uh, it may cause a pericardial tamponade uh, and also it may cause severe aortic regurgitation because the aortic valve may become incompetent. So if the aortic dissection involves the ascending aorta, then that is an uh, indication for urgent surgery. The, the patient really needs to have the ascending aorta replaced. If the dissection is in the descending thoracic aorta, uh, in most cases, they can be managed with medication, with blood pressure control, uh, and in most cases, uh, surgery will not be required. Uh, but if the uh, dissection is complicated and it's in the descending thoracic aorta, uh, then we have the surgical option, and that could, and that nowadays is by the trans uh, trans catheter option as well, the trans the thoracic endovascular uh, aortic repair rather than open surgery but dissections of the ascending aorta would still require open surgery. So this is what the patient had done. She had a repair of the uh, aortic dissection, a replacement of the ascending aorta, and the aortic valve was uh, resuspended. This is the artificial uh, aortic tube valve, and she had an uneventful recovery uh, and is asymptomatic at six months. Now, these patients uh, typically do not just have a dissection in the ascending aorta. The aortic arch would also be dissected and the descending thoracic aorta would also still be dissected. Uh, but fortunately, as, as I mentioned, uh, in most of these cases, uh, uh, the, uh, the arch and the descending aorta is stabilized, but you do have to control the blood pressure well. And the best sort of medication for blood pressure control in these patients is a beta blocker because that will reduce the rate and the force of the uh, contraction of the heart. And only after you have maximized the uh, dosage of beta blockade, uh, and if the patient is still hy hypertensive, could you then add in other antihypertensives like a calcium antagonist or the ACE inhibitors or an ARB. 
but uh, and also these patients because they have a remaining dissection in the aortic arch and the descending thoracic aorta they do require a continued follow-up and at least uh, a repeat CT scan at three months, six months, and then once a year to be sure that the, the dissection in the thoracic aort descending thoracic aorta and the aortic arch has not uh, progressed. Uh, if it has progressed or if the dissection gets aneurysma, uh, then there would be an indication that some intervention uh, would be needed on the aortic arch or the descending thoracic aorta. So this is another example, a 45-year-old man. Uh, again, a classical history, uh, suggestive of an aortic dissection, a sudden onset of chest and back pain. Uh, CT scan confirmed the uh, type A aortic dissection. Type A uh, refers to any uh, aortic dissection of involving the ascending aorta. Uh, if the aortic dissection does not involve the ascending aorta, then it is called a type B dissection. Uh, so a type B dissection typically can be managed medically, but a type A dissection uh, needs to be managed by, uh, by, by surgery. And again, you can see the aortic dissection. In this case, you can see there's quite a complex tear in the uh, aortic arch. Uh, and so in this case, the aortic arch needed to be uh, replaced in addition to the ascending aorta replacement. So the extent of surgery would depend very much on how bad the aortic dissection is. Uh, some, uh, the, the, in these sort of cases, it is preferable, preferable to do the least uh, which is necessary so that we do not take too long to do the surgery. Uh, but in some cases, if the tear is very bad, then we do have to do a more extensive surgery like replacing the aortic arch uh, to uh, ensure a better uh, outcome for the patient. Uh, so the patient had an uneventful recovery and at one year, uh, he is uh, asymptomatic and, and well. So the take home message, aortic dissection involving the ascending aorta is a surgical emergency. Uncomplicated descending thoracic aorta dissection can be managed medically. Complicated descending thoracic aorta dissection should be managed by TIVA. Uh, yeah, so, so nowadays for the descending thoracic aorta, we very rarely need to do open surgery. We can uh, use a, a, a percutaneous option, uh, which we call TIVA, thoracic endovascular uh, aortic repair. Okay, uh, any questions so far on, uh, on uh, aortic disease or uh, aortic valve disease or mitral valve disease? Yeah, if there are no questions, if you have any questions, please do uh, type, type it in. Uh, if there are no questions or comments, then we will go on to aortic aneurysms. Now, because of course, the best thing is to avoid uh, aortic dissection. So how do we avoid aortic dissection? First of all, we have to control the blood pressure. We have, uh, have to ensure adequate blood pressure control uh, of hypertensive patients. Uh, and also we have to be able to pick up aortic aneurysms. Because typically, unless the patient is truly very hypertensive, patients aorta don't tend to dissect if they are completely normal. But uh, if the aorta is a bit aneurysm, a bit dilated, then these are the patients who are at risk of an aortic dissection if we do not adequately uh, control the blood pressure. So blood pressure control is uh, important and also uh, a timely recognition of an ascending aortic aneurysm uh, is important. So this is a 39-year-old gentleman and he had been continuing of increasing shortness of breath for six months and a CT scan had shown an ascending aortic aneurysm, a six centimeter ascending aortic aneurysm and the echocardiography uh, showed severe aortic regurgitation with a dilated aortic root. So uh, in practice, a lot of these cases would have had an echocardiogram first. Uh, in these patients, uh, he was short of breath so he had an echo and that showed he has severe aortic regurgitation and a dilated aortic root. Uh, the primary pathology in this patient would have been the dilated aortic root. As the root of the aorta dilates, uh, it then pulls the aortic valve apart and causes the aortic regurgitation. So, uh, but echocardiography can only see the more proximal part of the aorta. So uh, to, to diagnose the aneurysm definitively, uh, they would need a CT scan which would be able to image the entire 
ascending aorta. So he came for surgery and you can see that this is the heart here, this is the ascending aorta, this is the aortic root. You can see the aortic root here is much bigger than that here. So that this is the uh, aortic aneurysm. Uh, once the aneurysm is uh, dilated beyond five and a half centimeters, uh, then surgery is recommended to prevent an aortic dissection and rupture. So uh, this is what the patient had done here, the uh, aortic root and the ascending aorta uh, replace. Uh, essentially, uh, this is what is done. The coronary arteries also arise from the aortic root. So the surgery, uh, if we're doing an aortic root replacement, will involve detaching the coronary arteries from the aorta and then suturing it back again to the uh, graft, which we had uh, sutured into the aortic root. So uh, it is quite an extensive operation. Uh, if the aneurysm does not involve the root, but just involves the ascending aorta, then we can replace the ascending aorta above the origins of the coronary artery. And that would be a more simpler uh, operation to do because we don't have then to detach the coronary arteries and re-implant the coronary arteries. So this is another case, a 70-year-old man, and, and this just uh, illustrates to you the range of uh, presenting symptoms for the patients with aortic disease. Uh, this 70-year-old man actually presented with a dry cough and a hoarse voice uh, for one month. Uh, and was doing a CT scan which uh, picked up uh, aortic aneurysm in the aortic arch. Uh, and this is where the uh, aneurysm is. Uh, as, if you can remember, the recurrent laryngeal nerve would be in this region, and that was why he was complaining of a hoarse voice and a cough. Uh, so uh, an aneurysm in this location, as you can see, is right in the same location as the subclavian artery and the left common carotid artery. So, uh, so this sort of operation, this sort of uh, lesion would require a replacement of the uh, aortic arch. Uh, and this is essentially, there are a few options, uh, replacement of the aortic arch, or you have the endovascular option as well. Uh, now with the endovascular option, because, uh, uh, because of the location of this aneurysm, the stent graft would actually have to occlude both the subclavian artery and the left common carotid artery because you will have to uh, deploy the stent graft right until there. So that will block off these two arteries. Uh, so if you were to put a stand graft in, you also have to bypass the left subclavian and the left common carotid artery. So we could put grafts, uh, joint stitch grafts onto the subclavian artery and the left common carotid artery and stitch them to the ascending aorta, or you could stitch them to the other artery, the uh, brachiocephalic artery or innominate artery. Uh, the drawback with this is that then all the blood supply to the head uh, then comes from just one artery uh, and, and then uh, after the intervention, the, the patient would need to run at the higher blood pressure to, to ensure there's adequate perfusion of the brain and the arms. So uh, if the patient is fit enough, the open aortic arch replacement is still the better option. Uh, but of course, if they are very, very sick and fit for surgery, then uh, we can do the uh, TIVA, which is the endovascular approach, uh, and bypass the head and neck vessels. Uh, but in the long term, uh, it is not as good as an open arch replacement. So then it depends again on the, uh, the age of the patient and also how fit the patient is. The third option is of course to manage them medically uh, with beta blockers, calcium antagonists and ARBs to control the blood pressure. But then we know that the, 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 there is this aneurysm, it is at risk of rupture. And in this particular patient, uh, his presenting symptom was that of a hoarse voice. Uh, so medical treatment would not actually treat the symptoms. Uh, and actually, uh, TIVA in this, in this particular patient also would not treat the patient because he, he would still be left with that aneurysm. So the, the only option to treat the, the symptoms for this patient is the arch replacement, uh, which also would have in, increased his uh, survival. Uh, so this is what was done. Uh, he had an aortic arch replacement uh, and uh, he, he made a very good uh, recovery from, from that. Uh, this is another case, a 69-year-old lady. Uh, now, this lady had uh, aneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta, both the descending thoracic aorta and also the abdominal aorta. 
and this was treated endovascularly in uh, 2013, so uh, many years ago. And then uh, at follow-up scans, because uh, we have to follow all of these patients up, um, she then developed an aneurysm in the ascending aorta over the years. Uh, and along with that, there was an endoleak. Endoleak meaning that there was a leak uh, in between the stent and the uh, aortic wall. And what had happened is the ascending aorta and the aortic arch had continued to dilate. And so it then became, the arch became too big for the stent, which was put in previously. And so uh, it started leaking blood out of the stent and into the aortic wall. And of course, then there was this aneurysm of the ascending aorta. So that had to be treated. Uh, there were a few options. You can see this is the ascending aorta aneurysm. Uh, and so we chose to, in this case, to replace the ascending aorta and the aortic arch, and then put a new stent graft into the descending thoracic artery inside the old uh, stent, which she already had. Uh, so, so this is the device. This is the tube graft, which will suture to the ascending aorta to replace it. These are the small branches we can suture to the neck vessels. And then this, are the, this is the new stent which is put inside the old stem and it opens up. Uh, so, so then there's to stop the leakage of the, to stop the endovascular leak. So we have a lot of new types of graphs and devices we can use to uh, replace the ascending aorta or the stent. And the uh, treatment option has really uh, expanded quite widely and the, the uh, technicalities of doing the procedure have been are now a lot easier compared to previously because of the advancement in the uh, graphs which we, which we have now. Uh, so that, that is the example, the, the descending, the stand graph comes all compressed and once it's deployed into the descending iota, it is uh, released. This is uh, called a frozen elephant trunk because it looks like an elephant trunk. And these are just some images from, uh, from surgery where the stand graph is being uh, deployed into the descending uh, thoracic aorta. Uh, and this is the end result. So the ascending aorta and the aortic arch have been replaced and you can't see it, but there's a stand graph inside the descending thoracic aorta, uh, what we call a frozen elephant trunk stand graph of the descending thoracic aorta. And this is the X-ray of the patient after surgery. You can see this graph, this lines here, this straight lines is the old stand graph. And this spiral here is the new stand graph, which is inside the old stand graph. And then the, the surgical graph, we can't see on x-ray, but there's a surgical graph uh, here, uh, which joins up to the uh, aortic root. And these are the sternal wires uh, after surgery. So she's now two, two years after surgery and she's uh, doing very well. Uh, she still needs uh, yearly CT scans. Her whole aorta has now been either replaced or is stented all the way down to the eyelid arteries. Uh, so hopefully nothing else can go wrong with the with her aorta now. And this is what it looks like on a CT scan. Uh, this is the old stent all the way down to the lower abdominal aorta. This virus here is the new uh, stent graph. And this here is the surgical graph. You can see it looks just like the uh, original uh, aorta, the native aorta. You can't really tell the difference. Uh, uh, it, has been it has been sutured to the uh, proximal ascending aorta. And this is the follow-up scan which shows that there's no more uh, endoleak. So ascending aorta and aortic arch aneurysms should be treated if greater than 55 millimeters or 50 millimeters in the presence of connective tissue disease, uh, such as such as Marfan disease or ehlers danlos syndrome uh, to prevent dissection and rupture. Uh, so of course it is uh, better, it is, uh, although we can treat aortic disease very effectively if it has aneurysm or dissection, it is still better to prevent the need for such surgery uh, if possible in the first place. So. So we can treat it with medication by controlling blood pressure. Uh, and also, if we know there are risk factors for this, like a patient with Marfan syndrome, uh, family history of Marfan syndrome, for example, then we can uh, uh, 
monitor this patient and if there's signs that the aortic root is starting to get bigger but has not reached the size to indicate the need to replace it, uh, for example, if it reaches four and a half centimeter to five centimeter, we can actually intervene at that stage to wrap uh, uh, an aortic uh, strong cloth around the aortic root and ascending aorta to prevent it from getting any bigger. So uh, the advantage of doing this is that the surgery is a much, uh, it's a lesser surgery compared to uh, replacing the aortic arch replacement because all we have to do uh, is we, we stitch this cloth around the, we wrap this cloth around the aortic root and the ascending aorta uh, to prevent it any bigger. So we don't need to replace the aorta. There's less, uh, uh, there's no need to go on the heart lung machine, uh, for example, to do the operation. And technically, we still need to open the chest, uh, but the operation is more straightforward than uh, needing to replace the aorta. Uh, so there's this option, but we do need to pick up the uh, condition early uh, before it has reached the size where uh, open surgery is, is needed. Uh, now, this surgery only works if the uh, if the uh, this uh, Dacron wrap is exactly the same size as the aortic root. So we would measure, we would do a CT scan, and then we would we will manufacture a custom made uh, wrap according to the size and geometry of the aortic root. So that's why this, this procedure is called a personalized external aortic root support or pair surgery. So each uh, patient will need to have a custom made a wrap according to the geometry of the uh, of the aorta, and this is what it looks like. The uh, the the wrap has been wrapped around the ascent aortic root and the ascending aorta. Uh, this and these are the studies that they, we showed that uh, following this procedure, the size of the aorta is stabilized; it does not get any bigger. Uh, so the personalized external aortic root support surgery is beneficial in dilated aortic roots of 40 to 50 millimeters uh, with Marfan syndrome or other connective tissue diseases. Okay, so that's aortic aneurysms. Uh, any questions on that from, from anyone? No questions on that, okay. So we go on to the last topic on aortic tumors. Um, Aortic tumors are not so common, but it does happen. So this is a 56-year-old lady, and she had been complaining of upper back pain over the last few months. And the tumor had shown, uh, a CT scan had shown a tumor in the descending thoracic aorta. So that's the tumor there. Uh, so these are very challenging cases. And uh, the uh, option is for any cancer surgery. Uh, if it is possible to reset it, then uh, that is the best option. Uh, so this patient had the tumor resected. You can see that's the tumor there. But after resection, uh, a lot of these patients also typically would need uh, radiotherapy uh, to uh, ensure it does not recur again. The long-term outcomes in this aortic lyomyosarcoma is unfortunately not too good. Uh, surgery would still have a better outcome than uh, non-surgical treatment, uh, but the but the disease-free survivor, uh, unfortunately, is not so good in the longer term. So, uh, so this is not a good uh, condition to have. But uh, if if you can, you can. The other options, of course, to just manage it with uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, then, of course, if the tumor is too large or has uh, metastasized, then uh, palliative care is is an option as well. So this is a rare tumor, usually diagnosed at advanced stage. Uh, surgical resection offers the best outcome, but prognosis is still poor, and adjuvant chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, may improve outcomes. So uh, we then go on to coronary disease. Uh, I, I think uh, coronary disease uh, we are all familiar with, uh, but just to uh, perhaps describe what bypass surgery involves. Bypass surgery involves uh, essentially, nowadays we typically take the left internal thoracic artery from under the chest wall and either a vein from the leg or from the arm to then stitch onto the coronary arteries 
bypassing the stenosis proximally. So it is interesting that most patients with coronary disease have the coronary disease proximally in the uh, coronary artery. And uh, uh, so, the, uh, so, so the proximal part of the coronary artery is like the highway and the distal part is like the town where the blood needs to reach. So fortunately, because of the nature of coronary disease, uh, we can uh, uh, manage this quite well with bypass surgery to bypass the stenosis proximally and then just uh, anastomose the graft uh, distally so blood can reach the heart. Of course, most cases of coronary disease is treated nowadays either with medical treatment uh, because most coronary disease is not that severe. So uh, if the coronary disease does not involve the left anterior descending artery, then in most cases, uh, if the patient is stable and has not had a myocardial infarction, they can be managed with medical treatment. And medical treatment has advanced uh, rapidly nowadays. But if they still have symptoms uh, with optimal medical treatment, then a stent, a percutaneous coronary intervention by stenting, uh, is uh, uh, the best option. Uh, uh, but if the patient has got multi-vessel coronary artery disease, so if they've got disease in all the three coronary arteries, uh, or within one coronary artery, they have disease in a few places, uh, then coronary stenting is not uh, the best treatment because then it would require a lot of stents to be implanted. Uh, and the more stents which are implanted, the more risk there is for the patient to, for the stent to occlude uh, and for the patient to need another re-intervention. And there's always a delay between the stent uh, occluding and then the subsequent re-intervention. So during this period, the, the, the left ventricle always, always uh, 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 suffers, uh, has, has an impact on the left ventricle. And so that's why in patients with multi-vessel coronary artery disease, uh, bypass grafting is still the best option, uh, whereas for lesser degrees of coronary disease than coronary stenting and medical treatment uh, uh, are the better option. So the, different, the, the bypass surgery will bypass both the culprit lesion and an advantage of that is also protects against future lesions because a lot of the problem is that uh, if we put in a stent, for example, uh, the, the stent nowadays are very good and they don't tend to, as, as uh, compared to previously, they don't tend to block off as much as they used to but even in the best stand there is, the stand remains perfect, but new disease will develop uh, before or after the stand. So if we put a stand here, then new disease develops before or after the stand. Then we will need to have another procedure to put in another stand in, at the place of the new disease. Whereas with bypass surgery, even if new disease develops, it doesn't matter because the whole at risk region is bypassed. So even if it blocks off completely, it doesn't matter because then blood will just flow through the, uh, the new bypass grafts to, to the heart. Uh, and that's the difference between bypass surgery and stents, coronary stents, uh, because coronary stents only treats the culprit lesion and does not protect against uh, future lesions. Uh, the recovery after bypass surgery is about one week in hospital. Typically, now they stay two days in the ICU and five days in the ward. Uh, they, they should avoid driving for six weeks. Uh, after six weeks, they can drive again. The stenotomy, the bone takes uh, up to three months to heal completely. So they should avoid carrying heavy things for three months. Uh, after three months, most patients will feel better uh, than compared to uh, before uh, surgery. Uh, they still have to continue on medications even after surgery. The most important is the aspirin. Uh, either aspirin or Plavix or Brilinta. Uh, in the first one year, the first 12 months, we now recommend them to be on dual, dual antiplatelets, both aspirin and clopidogrel. Uh, after one year, they can then just be on a single antiplatelet, and this can be either uh, aspirin or Plavix. Uh, control of the cholesterol is also very important, the statins. Even if the cholesterol is normal after surgery, they still should continue on the statins uh, because there's some evidence that the statins will uh, uh, ensure that the bypass grafts last uh, a lot longer uh, for the patient. So we maintain all patients on statins regardless of what their LDL is. And of course, all these patients should have an LDL of less than 2.6. Um, even if we can achieve that, 
uh, without as statins, we would still recommend they continue on the statins because that does seem to have impact on the uh, the graph patency. Uh, and of course, the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, uh, uh, the ARBs, if they have previous myocardial infarction or LV dysfunction, is important. And control of hypertension and diabetes. Diabetes particularly is very important to uh, to control if, if the patient is diabetic. The stenotomy is usually not a painful wound because uh, there's no movement in the bone. Uh, all wounds uh, uh, do not have pain if there's no movement. But the, the pain comes when there's movement between the tissue. So fortunately, the stenotomy wound is usually very stable, so it's not usually a very painful uh, operation. And most patients are okay with just paracetamol when they go home. Uh, if they still have pain, then we can give tramadol. Uh, it is important uh, when you, if you do, uh, if the patient do come to you after surgery and with pain, that they are not started on a non-steroidal or the COX-2 inhibitors like Celebrex, because uh, this can uh, compromise the patency of the graph. So uh, CABG is a contraindication to COX-2 inhibitors uh, because of the uh, studies which have shown that it can uh, cause a blockage of the coronary bypass graphs. So uh, treat them with either Panadol or with some opiate-based opiate uh, analgesia and avoid the COX-2 inhibitors and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, CABG is now a safe operation. In most patients, typically the risk of a bypass operation is 1%, uh, hospital mortality and other risks such as a stroke, bleeding, infection or organ dysfunction. Uh, and these are the studies which have compared uh, bypass surgery against stenting in patients with multi-vessel coronary artery disease and left main stem disease. Uh, this is the Syntax trial over five years. You can see the blue line is that of bypass surgery, CABG, and the red lines are those uh, with stents, ACI. And you can see that over five years, those who have bypass surgery in blue, they have a lesser indicate, uh, incidence, they have less mortality, less stroke, less myocardial infarction, and less repeat revascularization. Uh, and these are in patients with multi-vessel coronary artery disease. And this is uh, looking at it in a, a bit more detail. You can see in all the subgroups of patients, the, the blue lines which are patients who have bypass surgery, they do better. There's less uh, mortality. Uh, less, of this, less of these patients have a mortality. And the more severe the, the coron coronary disease is, as reflected in the syntax score, which gives an indication of how severe the coronary disease is, the more severe it is, then the uh, better the outcomes with bypass surgery compared with uh, stents. Uh, and this is another study. This is the Freedom Trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so this is looking at death, myocardial infarction and stroke. And you can see those who have bypass surgery, the, these dotted lines here. Uh, after bypass surgery, they have less, less death, less myocardial infarction and less stroke compared to coronary stenting. Uh, and this is the long-term freedom trial. Uh, so this is looking at probability of survival. So how long the patient will live? And you can see the dotted line in blue, those who have bypass surgery will live a lot longer compared to those who have stents uh, uh, if they have multivessel coronary disease. For all the reasons which we uh, explained earlier, you know, the difference between coronary stents and bypass surgery. So coronary stents is very good for single vessel disease or if two vessels are diseased, or particularly if there are not many, many uh, stenosis or narrowings within the vessel. But if all the vessels are badly diseased and within each vessel there are diseases in several places, uh, then bypass surgery does have the best uh, long-term outcome for the patient. But of course, if the patient is uh, very elderly or have a lot of comorbidities or uh, high risk for surgery, then stenting would be the preferred option uh, because those patients, unfortunately, are unlikely to uh, have the survival benefit with surgery. If they have already got a lot of other medical problems, uh, they, they are unlikely to survive beyond 10 to 15 years. So in those patients, coronary stenting would be better because as you can see here, within the first three years, uh, there's no difference between uh, coronary stenting or bypass surgery. The benefits for bypass surgery comes in the longer term, after three years. 
So unless the patient can live beyond three years to see the benefits of bypass surgery, uh, then it is better to just uh, uh, do coronary stenting or just uh, manage this patient's medical treatment. But if the patient is uh, well, they have not got too many comorbidities, the risk of surgery is low, and particularly if the patients are younger in their 60s or 70s, uh, then uh, bypass surgery would be recommended. Uh, because that will likely improve their life expectancy significantly more compared to uh, coronary stenting. So this is another study uh, showing the same thing. Uh, this is looking at uh, incidence of uh, death, myocardial infarction, repeat revascularization. Uh, these are all lower compared uh, with bypass surgery compared with uh, PCI. This is the best trial. So the take-home message Bypass surgery offers the best survivor and symptom-free survivor compared to PCI or medical treatment in multivessel coronary artery disease. The benefits of bypass surgery is even greater in those with more severe coronary artery disease, impaired heart function, and diabetes. Any questions on the uh, bypass surgery? No, no questions. Okay, uh, we're almost finishing. Um, uh, I think we can spend just a, a, some time on thoracic conditions. So there are a range of thoracic conditions which we can treat by surgery. So this is a 39-year-old lady who has severe sweating of the hands. Uh, and the sweating of the hands is uh, so severe that it affects her work with computers and writing. Because every time she writes, it wets the paper. Uh, and it, it uh, then uh, interferes with all the paperwork as well and with the smart screen. Uh, she's tried various treatments. Uh, the treatments you can try with these uh, medical treatments with creams uh, and uh, which you can, uh, uh, aluminium based cream. There's also a medical treatment you can try with oxybutynin, uh, but, uh, but this has not worked. So she has been diagnosed with severe hyperhidrosis. Uh, now severe hyperhidrosis, uh, if it is refractory to conventional treatments such as creams and medication, can be treated by surgery because the sweating of the hands uh, comes off the, uh, is controlled by the sympathetic nerve. And this travels at the back of the, the chest wall. So we can divide the sympathetic chain um, through keyhole surgery, through video assisted thoroscopic surgery, we can make two small cuts at the side of the chest and then divide the sympathetic chain at two levels to interrupt the, uh, the, the sweating in the hands. And so the result is almost immediate. The patient will have a dry and, and warm hand. Uh, so the two five millimeter incision on each side of the chest divide the sympathetic chain at T3 and T4 it can be done as a day case, but many patients prefer to spend one night in hospital uh, and the satisfaction rate is 95%. The compensatory, the side effects from this treatment is that you may get uh, increased sweating elsewhere, what we call compensatory uh, sweating. Uh, but most patients, 95% of patients tell us that they prefer that and, and uh, are quite pleased that the hand is dry and they do not mind uh, the increased sweating elsewhere. Uh, there's also um, uh, gustatory sweating, meaning increased sweating after eating or during eating. So there are side effects, but 95% of patients are quite pleased with the results of this on the, on the hands. So other treatment options, as we can see, uh, should be explored first. Uh, lifestyle changes, uh, treatment of anxiety. Uh, most of these patients uh, uh, would have uh, this address already and usually anxiety alone is not sufficient to cause this degree of hypohidrosis but it can contribute so important to treat this first antiperspirants with aluminium based compounds anticholinogenics or uh, this botulinum toxin injection removal so again these are uh, less commonly done nowadays because the uh, sympathetic is uh, a much better and more effective treatment than uh, removal of sweat glands and uh, uh, injections. So, uh, of course, another 
uh, condition we can treat now. This is myasthenia gravis. If poorly controlled myasthenia gravis, and this lady, 69, she had drooping eyelids uh, uh, despite medical treatment, uh, and the CT scan shown a thymoma. Now, if on the CT scan we pick up a thymoma, then we do need to reset the thymoma because uh, the thymoma will uh, will grow if it's left alone, and there is a risk that it may be it may turn malignant. But if there's no thymoma and it's just thymus tissue, then we can manage this just with medication. But uh, doing a thymectomy, uh, removing the thymus and surgery is an option uh, if the symptoms of myasthenia gravis are not uh, well controlled uh, with with medica medical treatment. So this is the thymus. This is a thymectomy. So the entire thymus is removed and there's a thymoma here uh, in this region which is also uh, removed as well. And usually with these patients after a thymectomy, they will report an improvement in their symptoms. Uh, and most of these patients are able to reduce the amount of medications they are on for myasthenia gravis. So the improvement in myasthenic symptoms occurs in 80 to up to 100% of patients after thymectomy and between 30 to 50% of these have a drug-free complete remission without the need for any medication in the long term after a, a, a thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. Uh, so this is a pneumothorax, 39-year-old 39 lady, second time recurrent pneumothorax. Not sure you can see that here, but she has a left pneumothorax. And on CT scan, you can see that she has got bullous lung disease. So if they've got bullous lung disease, even if uh, there's some uh, evidence now that if they have bullous lung disease after a first time pneumothorax, they should probably have surgery to reset the bully uh, and also do a pleural disease or pleural abrasion to prevent the uh, recurrence of pneumothorax. Uh, if there's no bully at all, then you can wait until the patient has one recurrence uh, before uh, recommending surgery for, for them. So this is the uh, bullae at surgery. You can see this is the lung. This is the lung bullae uh, here. Uh, and at surgery, we would have resected the uh, bullous lung disease. And we also have done a pleural disease. Okay. Uh, Brian, there's one question on the question box, but I can't see the question here. Maybe you could write the question for me. <laughs> Sorry, right, there's one question, but I don't, I don't see it on my, on my box here. Okay. So this is the, this is the keyhole surgery, it's done at VETS. Uh, this is the stapler to reset the bullet. That's the bullet here. And in this case, we have put some powder in to do the pleurodesis. It's called the, the TELP pleurodesis. So the recurrence rate after a first time pneumothorax is 30%. Uh, after a second time is uh, 67%. And uh, the risk factors for recurrence is that of pulmonary fibrosis, uh, the younger patients, those who are very thin and tall, uh, older patients also. So the, the extreme of ages, either very young or older patients, those who are smokers or have increased height to weight ratio, uh, and then after a pneumothorax on one side, there's a 10 to 15% risk of a pneumothorax ha happening in the opposite side. But usually we, we would not recommend any intervention on the other side. So even if we did a pneumothorax surgery on the left side, after left-sided pneumothorax, for example, we would just uh, warn the patient that there's a 10 to 15% risk that it may occur on the other side, uh, but uh, we wouldn't do anything unless it does happen. If it does happen, then we would recommend surgery on the other side as well. The mortality of pneumothorax is not high, it's 0.09% it's, uh, because nowadays patients can get to a healthcare facility uh, fairly quickly. But of course, if you live in a remote area where it takes a long time to get to a healthcare facility, then uh, the, there is a, the risk of having a pneumothorax may be, may be more significant. So the treatment options for pneumothorax immediately, if it's only a small pneumothorax, you can just observe it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some, if it's very small, you can just observe, patient can go home, come back the next day for another x-ray, or you could keep the patient in the hospital and uh, do an x-ray the next day. Uh, if it's a bit bigger, you can aspirate it. 
And then if it's very big nematuroids, then you require an uh, intercostal chest strain or a big tail catheter. Uh, even if you put an intercostal chest straining, it does not need to be a very big uh, chest strain because you're, you're only draining air out. So a very small uh, chest strain should be, should be sufficient. And this is what is done with pleural abrasion. The, we scratch the chest wall to trigger some inflammation so that the uh, chest, so that the lung will stick to the chest wall. Uh, so the idea of this is that even if another part of the lung should start leaking again, the lung won't collapse because the fibrosis would have made the lung stick to the chest wall. So, so then uh, you won't at least get a tension in motorex. The lung may collapse a little bit, but it won't collapse very much. So it, it will still be uh, a safe condition and it won't be life threatening. So this is what it looks like after surgery. This is some small cuts at the side of the chest from which uh, uh, we can put in the instruments to do the surgery. The size of this is like the, the size of a chest strain insertion. In fact, one of these holes is the chest strain the patient had uh, when he presented with a, a pneumothorax. So the success rate to, to prevent recurrence, uh, if we just put an intercostal chest strain and put some, we, we can put some talc through the chest strain to do a chemical pleurodesis through the chest strain, but the recurrence rate is, not, uh, is, is higher because the long-term success of that is 75 to 85 percent. But if we do it by vets, uh, then the success rate is 90, 90 to 98 uh, percent. If we combine it with a uh, bullectomy, then it is close to 100 percent. So the most effective treatment to prevent a recurrence is to do a vet surgery. That's is video assisted fluoroscopic surgery. But if the patient is very old and not fit for surgery, then we can put in the pleurodesis, we can do the pleurodesis through the chest strain, but the long-term results is not, not as good. So surgery is the best option in pneumothorax if it is recurrent, uh, if it happens on the opposite side from previously, if they are bilateral pneumothorax, uh, or if you're putting a chest strain in and the air is persisting for more than four to five days. Uh, if the presentation is that of a tension pneumothorax, then surgery is advised because you don't want the patient to come back again with another tension pneumothorax because that's life-threatening. Uh, if there's chemo pneumothorax, then surgery is also indicated. Or if you have had lung surgery or pneumonectomy on the opposite side, or for certain professions, if you're a pilot or diver, or you live in remote areas, then surgery is advisable after uh, at the first pneumothorax presentation. Uh, the other condition we treat is, of course, lung cancer. So this is a condition, of course, like uh, any cancer, it, it depends on the stage of the disease. Uh, as with any cancer, the best treatment is to remove it, if possible. So if the, if the uh, cancer is diagnosed at stage one or stage two, then surgery is the best option. We can be completely removed and the chances of a cure is there. But if the cancer is stage three or stage four, then it needs to be discussed at the uh, multidisciplinary meeting. Uh, definitely they should have some chemotherapy and they can be considered for surgical resection as well if appropriate uh, or they can just be treated with radical radiotherapy and uh, chemotherapy. So the operability of the uh, lung cancer depends not only on the size and how much of the uh, lung is involved but also whether it's involved adjacent structures and also in, in uh, lung cancer, whether it's spread to the central lymph nodes, what we call the N2 lymph nodes in the center of the chest. Uh, if there's a lot of lymph nodes involved in the center of the chest, then uh, surgery does not give any advantage in the long term. And these patients are better treated with uh, chemotherapy and, and radiotherapy. So uh, surgery is uh, recommended in a range of heart, lung, and chest conditions. Uh, early referral is appropriate when surgery is indicated and facilitates a better outcome uh, for the patient. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. I think there are some, uh, some questions here. If I can uh, just see. Uh, so, uh, so it's this question, question, who performs the surgery for aortic dissection? the vascular surgeon or the cardiothoracic surgeon. So it depends on where the, the dissection is. So uh, 
the, the, if the dissection is in the ascending iota and the arch and the descending iota, then that is done by the cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, if it's in the abdominal iota and sometimes in the thoracic iota, then that is done by the vascular surgeon. So it so it's tailored according to uh, where the uh, where the the location of the aortic dissection and also uh, what what type of intervention uh, is is indicate is needed. So typically uh, for the uh, ascending aortic dissection, it should be seen by the cardiothoracic surgeon. We may we may well involve a multidisciplinary team because sometimes. Uh, although I, may, I say that in most cases we just need to deal with the ascending aorta and the rest of the aorta can be managed medically but sometimes we have a very complicated dissection in which after we have replaced the ascending aorta and the arch and the descending uh, we still need uh, some intervention on the remaining parts of the aorta because of the dissection is leaking there or it has got very aneurysma so then we will then involve the vascular surgeons in addition to uh, do some endovascular stenting in the remaining part of the aorta. So nowadays, a lot of the work is uh, is uh, uh, multidisciplinary. So we have a multidisciplinary aortic team uh, where we can tackle the uh, aortic conditions uh, regardless of where the, uh, the, the the problem is. So um, I think uh, I don't get any more questions. Um, I don't see any here, but uh, I, I didn't see this question also. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, any more questions? No. Okay. So I think uh, there are no more questions. I hope that has been. Uh, I hope that has been useful, uh, and uh, uh, that has been helpful. Uh, and uh, I hope that. Uh, thank you to the MMA Negri Sembilan for uh, for arranging this. It's been. A great pleasure to have shared some uh, some information and on uh, managing patients with uh, heart, lung, and chest conditions with you. Uh, be very pleased to give uh, further talks, uh, or if you have requests for particular topics you want to hear about in more detail, I'll be very happy to uh, uh, to, to do so. So thank you very much once again. Uh, it's a shame I can't see you because of the setup of this Zoom, uh, but I hope. Uh, I hope uh, we will meet someday. Uh, thank you and have a very good weekend. Goodbye.